Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Toxicology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I am Ian Wolf. On this edition, Oren Katz from Symbiotica talks about frog steak bioart. And part two of Dr. Bernard Robertson Dunn from the Australian Privacy Foundation talking about electronic health records. But first up, here's the news. (music) Drinking alcohol causes cancer. Analysis of a wide variety of studies over the last 10 years has shown that alcohol causes the development of cancer of the breast colon, liver, oropharynx, larynx, esophagus, colon, and rectum. Growing evidence suggests that alcohol is also likely to cause skin, prostate, and pancreatic cancer. The analysis was performed by Jenny Connor of the Preventative and Social Medicine Department at Otago University in New Zealand. She's shown that there is a direct relationship to how much alcohol you drink and your risk of these forms of cancer. While people who drink the most are also most at risk, Connor has found that even low to moderate drinkers are at an increased risk of cancer and should probably reduce their drinking. In February, Professor Dame Sally Davies, the Chief Medical Officer for England, publicly warned people that alcohol causes breast cancer. Professor Davies told Parliament, Do as I do when I reach for my glass of wine. Think, do I want the glass of wine or do I want to raise my own risk? of breast cancer. I take a decision each time I have a glass. Davies has contributed to new guidelines for maximum recommended alcohol consumption for England. The new maximum recommended weekly alcohol intake has gone down from 21 units to 14 units or 7 pints of British beer a week. A Cancer Research UK study showed that while 4 out of 5 people knew that alcohol causes liver cancer, only one in five knew that alcohol causes breast cancer. Cancer Research UK suggests that people have some alcohol-free days every week, try swapping every second alcoholic drink for a soft drink, and don't keep alcohol at home. Connor's study found that smoking and drinking alcohol magnify the increased risk of cancer of throat and mouth more than smoking or drinking on their own. Drinkers who avoid alcohol reduce their risk of cancer by larger amounts, the longer they abstain. She concluded that drinking over the new recommended weekly maximum also increases drinkers' risk of heart and liver disease, strokes, and pancreatitis. The study was published in the journal Addiction and was titled Alcohol Consumption as a Cause of Cancer. And finally, as you can hear, I have the flu again. Have you ever thought about doctors' waiting rooms? They're a hive of infection. You're asked to share a room with people coughing, sneezing and touching things, as if doctors had never heard of germ theory or the concept of hygiene, at the exact time when you're most vulnerable to new infections. I get that people have to wait for the doctors, but why can't a new system be designed that reduces as much as possible the chance of infection spreading from other people sitting in the room with you? And you to them! Perhaps a good start would be an air conditioning system with ultraviolet lights to kill the incoming bacteria and viruses. Perhaps instead of one big waiting room of shared misery and infection, we'd have booths, or at least petitions. Send me your ideas for making waiting rooms less infectious. To science at diffusionradio.com You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send email to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. At the Sydney Science Festival, the BioFoundry held a panel discussion about community biohacking at the Australia Technology Park in Redfern. Oren Katz is the director of Symbiotica, a centre for excellence in biological arts at the University of Western Australia, 
and Professor of Contestable Design at the Royal College of Arts in London. I spoke to him after the panel and began by asking him, what are you working on at Symbiotica? So Symbiotica is a, an artistic research institute that looks at uh, life from the submolecular to the ecological. We are working in the lab, so we're based in a biological science department. The condition that we have to anyone who's coming to do research with us is that they're going to spend some time in the lab and get their hands wet and engage in some way or another with the manipulation of life. Uh, my own research for the last 20 years concentrated mainly around the idea of using living tissues from complex organisms as a medium for artistic expression. Uh, so I've done things like uh, growing meat in the lab. Apparently I'm the first person to grow and eat a piece of meat uh, that was grown in the lab. Uh, I've grown leather, but I'm really interested in how taking the, the ways in which we are now decontextualizing life and the way we're um, taking life and making it into a raw material uh, to be engineered are impacting on our understanding of life and my thesis is basically that we, it, it's incompatible that we, we live in a time where our cultural perceptions of life are incompatible with our scientific understanding of life and even more importantly in the way we choose to engage with life technologically as a, and as an artist I'm really interested in probing those areas. So did you create art when you were creating meat in the lab? Yeah, so I never tried to feed the world. Uh, that project in particular was really dealing with uh, one of the most uh, intimate relationship that anyone can form with another life form, uh, and that's basically uh, incorporating it as, as part of your own body. You know, you, you can't get more intimate than that. It's much, but you know, it's much closer than having sex. Yeah. So, um, so I was really interested in using this idea of what it means to now fragment bodies of complex organisms and maintain parts of them in the lab and then consuming them as food um, as a questioning of those relationships. Uh, interesting enough now, there's uh, scientists and companies that claim that they want to do it uh, as a way of uh, feeding the world, which led me to a really interesting shift in quite a lot of my practice because now I'm probing those things and pointing out how things like uh, growing meat in the lab is a symptom of some of the main problems that we face as a society rather than a solution that those people claim that they have. And how did people, well, did you perform eating it in the, or how did you present this to the public? Right, so the first steak that uh, myself and my collaborator Yonat Zur uh, grown back in the year 2000, we couldn't consume because uh, we were working at the time as research fellows in Harvard Medical School and it was a biomedical uh, research uh, lab and they didn't have a license to grow food, so we couldn't eat it. So in 2003, we were invited to a show in France, uh, which had enough uh, resources to allow us to basically build a fully functioning lab in the gallery, including a dining room. And we were playing on this idea of what constitutes foul food. So we knew that French people don't like engineered uh, food very much, and we knew that most other cultures don't like eating frogs very much. So we combined those two things together and we tissue engineered frog steaks. Uh, we then basically, for the three months of the exhibition, every day we would perform what we refer as the ritual of feeding and caring. We would go in and feed the cells and feed our food. Um, and then at the very last day of the exhibition, we invited a few people from the audience as well as the curator of the show and some others to join us into this ultimate uh, Nouveau Cuisine dinner. We only were able to grow about five grams of uh, this meat and we all consumed it together as a performative act. I was really lucky as well that uh, three out of the six people we invited spat the bits out because they were so... Un I suppose the texture was the main issue, um, uh, which allowed me to then collect those bits that were spat out and show them in the follow-up exhibition where we had a video documentation of the whole process plus, plus the bits that were spat out by the audience members. And what did you feed the meat? Mm. This is a great question because this is one of the issues that we face uh, constantly in this discussion where now when people talk about uh, growing meat in the lab, the lab seems to be like this magical space where you put stem cells on one hand and you get a steak on the other hand and kind of by magic it kind of grows. Um, what we fed uh, and what is still being used extensively to feed cells in culture uh, is between 10 and 20 percent fetal calf serum. So it's basically the blood plasma of unborn cow. Uh, cows that um, have been slaughtered and the blood has been sucked out and that's being used for feeding it uh, plus 80% or between 80 and 90% of uh, other things that cells need. In a sense, what you try to do, you try to emulate the conditions in the body 
Um, so you provide all of the nutrients. The, the, the nutrient solution is like the blood. It provides all of the sugars, the protein or the amino acids, and all of the other things that uh, cells need in order to grow. So scientists, and, and apparently we just heard tonight, biohackers are trying to find solutions for that. I, I wish them the best of luck. Um, I know that scientists for the last 60 years were trying to find alternatives. It's not as easy as going into a biohacking space and in reinventing something like that. There's about 40,000 different compounds in phytocapsulum. And my understanding is that maybe half of it was defined and some of them are really difficult to synthesize. So I wouldn't hold my breath that we're going to avoid it. But even if that's the case, if we find an alternative to phytocapsulum, there's still other animal uh, derived um, reagents that are being used in the uh, process of growing those cells, as well as on a more general term, there's a really easy solution to deal with the issues of overconsumption of meat and that's just reduce or stop eating meat altogether but within the climate we operate in and, and this was this tonight was a great example of that it's not a viable business model so it's being rejected as a way rather than investing there's a company that just raised 40 million dollars to try and grow meat in the lab if you use a fraction of it to try to encourage people to figure out ways and, and actually you know, not, not even convince them, inform them that eating so much meat is not really the best thing that they can do to their health. That might be a really better, a, a much better way of doing it. But again, it doesn't operate under the current models, modes of thinking that, again, with my extreme disappointment, it seems that what biohacker spaces, as we heard tonight, are doing are basically following the footsteps and becoming part of the problem and are not providing us any, any solutions in the way we think about how to go about to do with life. And, and it's a shame actually that today I didn't really have an opportunity to talk about one of the interesting things that can come out of the new understanding of life is actually rather than trying to industrialize biology, which is kind of the conversation we had tonight, we might need to think about biologizing industry and actually learn from the way biological systems operate in order to really transform the way we do things rather than to try to apply 19th century engineering uh, mindsets and 20th century um, economic mindsets onto living systems. Well, Oren, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. That was Oren Katz, Director of Symbiotica, a Centre for Excellence in Biological Arts at the University of Western Australia. At the Sydney Mini Makers Fair this year, I had equipment failure, which has resulted in me buying a brand new recorder. But it also meant that I only got one little interview for the whole weekend. I spoke to Richard Brophy, who works with the Innovators Club, a community innovation organisation. I began by asking him, at the Innovators Club, what do you do? At a top level, we're trying to democratise innovation. You know, for too long, it's kind of been absconded into labs or to high-level corporates, so we're trying to give everyone a go. No one seems to really know what it is, so we're kind of opening it up for the masses. And how do you do that? If someone comes along, what do they do with you? So we run monthly innovation workshops where we start with a pretty simple, easy to understand problem and then we explore the problem, work out who we're really solving it for, why it's a problem, what are the costs involved, that kind of thing. It gets a little bit like school for the first 10-15 minutes of our workshops where everyone sits diligently and works hard. Um, and then once we've defined the problem, we define who we're solving it for, then we start ideating solutions. And then um, within your groups, people pitch their ideas to each other. You'll decide which one you like. You'll prototype it as a group and then pitch it to the whole workshop. And then we pick a winner and the night is over. How are the problems chosen? Because we've got a pretty small window, four hours on a weeknight. Yes. If that, people get pretty tired after about 10 o'clock. And have had a few beers, so we try and pick problems that are easy to solve. We're running a series called Pop Innovation, so it's super simple problems. I think our first one was, how do you get a beer out of an esky without freezing your hands? Another one was, how do you get your equipment for a festival from the car to your camping spot? in an easier, more effective way. So that kind of stuff that everyone gets. You've got to work within the boundaries of what people know if you want to punch out a solution quick. So people do the workshop and they solve a problem and what should they be doing next? So once you've finished the workshop, if you've got a good solution, we encourage people to go off and work on the problem, which really is researching it, 
testing it with people and then reiterating all the boring stuff. We do the sexy, fun stuff at the start, get it over and done with in three hours, and then it's time to go through the slog, which is why we encourage collaboration in our workshops. I mean, it helps you have better ideas, but also it means that there's other people to rely on when the going gets tough or the money gets low. Where would people find you online? People can find us as the Innovators Club on Facebook, on Meetup, or at the-innovators.club. Well, Richard, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. That was Richard Brophy from the Innovators Club. And now the second and final part of my interview about electronic health records with Dr Bernard Robinson Dunn. He's chairman of the Privacy Foundation's Health Committee. I met him in Kibbery Park on Sydney's Milsons Point, where you can occasionally hear birdsong in the background. I began by asking him this time, are our national electronic health records secure? Well, the current eHealth, My Health Records system, is secure at the IT level, probably. In other words, a hacker trying to get into it would find it difficult to break into it and download lots of information. But that's IT security. That's not information security. I can do more. From an IT perspective, it might be all right, but from the, the people in, in, I guess it's always down to the people. I've read recently in the news that in Denmark, I think it was, they accidentally handed over the complete population's health records unencrypted on CD to their private outsourced data organisation. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so but that, that gets back to the comment that I made earlier, actually on the census one. That the biggest danger to information in the information system is the authorised user. Now, the way the health record has been structured is that if you go to a health care service provider and they are entitled to view your record, then the control on that record is at the institution level. So if you go to a large hospital as a patient, whatever consent is involved around all this lot, you give people the consent to see your record, Technically, anybody in the hospital who's entitled to see a health record can see your health record. The audit logs will show that the hospital has, has accessed your record. You will not know if it's the receptionist checking your date of birth, if it's uh, a surgical nurse checking that you're not allergic to something, if it's your surgeon who wants to make sure that what he's planning to do will work. There is no indication as to who has accessed your My Health record why they'd help access your health records and other issue because they've probably got their own records in the GP records but that's a separate issue. Um, in terms of access control, access control is done at the institutional level. So if someone is allowed to look at your record they can see it. If that person happens to be your ex or somebody who takes a dislike to you then you will not know and the system cannot control that at all. And there are, I have had some people ring me up saying, I work in the health system. How do I stop my colleagues viewing my health record? And I've said, sorry, you can't. And that's actually one of the internal systems. It's not my health record system. So it doesn't just apply to my health record. It applies to all these systems. Control needs to be at a very granular level. Now, the authorised access control is the biggest problem. One of the rules of privacy for this sort of thing really ought to be you only collect information that you really, really need. Yes. And that is reflected in something called the Caldecott Principles in the UK, where they did a big study on access to information, specifically health information, and they came up with a number of principles. And two that are really relevant are, one is you don't collect it unless you need it, as I've just mentioned, and the other one is a person can only see the data that they really need. It's a need-to-know basis. The way the My Health Record system has been constructed is if you have access to the health record, generally, unless you work very hard, you have access, access to everything. Now, what the federal government believed was that if all health data is put into one place, it will enhance healthcare. Unfortunately, it has a downside too, because certainly in the privacy area, if you put everybody's health information into one place, it means people who are interested in parts of it can see all of it. And the big danger area is mental health. And the Royal College of 
psychiatry, I think it is, have expressed concerns that information that really shouldn't be seen by non-psychiatrists is visible by everybody. So technically, if you go to see your pharmacist and they've signed up for this, and they want to make sure that you're not suffering from or potential drug interactions, they can still see your mental health record. In fact, they can also see if you've had a hysterectomy or an abortion or who you've seen. And there is no control at this sort of level, in other words, the content within the My Health Record system. It is mostly at the document level rather than the content. And trying to work out the benefits of this system, and there are a few, against the risks, of which there are many, um, it is arguable that My Health Record system should be replaced by other solutions to the problem the government has said they're trying to solve. The reason I mention that is that there's been reports recently of the UK where the care.data system was stopped. In the past year, 95% of GPs have provided online access for patients to see their health record. That was mandated by the government some time ago that this was to happen. It wasn't, didn't happen by accident. So the vendors who supply these health record systems that GPs use incorporated a patient portal. And as I said, 95% of GPs have these systems. So a patient can now see their health record, their current health record, as held by their GP. And in England, they only have one GP, so that's where all the health records are. At zero cost to the government, other than mandating that it be done, they have achieved many of the objectives that this, this government has said is behind the My Health Record. Patients having access to their information, becoming more involved in their own health care, etc, etc. You can extend this idea that says, why don't you just provide access to the GP records to the Australian environment? The argument that if you're out of your normal location and it would be really good if a hospital could, or GP could access your health record, then you can give them effectively patient access. If there's an emergency, then that can be accommodated because there is a health identifier system, and technically that could store your record of seeing GPs. An emergency worker could look up your identity in the health identity system, see who your last GP is, log on, and see your health record. That is full access to full record, well, at least in compared with what will be in the summary of the My Health Record system, it's almost certainly up to date. It cannot be more up to date because when you see your GP, it's updated. So you don't have the worry of information being in more than one place and keeping it up to date. It would appear to be something that's really worth looking at at low cost of the government to achieve some of the patient-oriented benefits of the My Health Record. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that sort of solution meets everybody's requirements because it is then far harder for researchers to get at health research data because there is no big database of lots of health records that they can examine, interrogate for research purposes. And that's a valid use for it if it's appropriate, sorry, if it's possible to get at it. And the current system, by having a lot of data inside PDFs, is a little difficult to analyse from a big data perspective. But accessing data in individual GP system is a two-edged sword. It's far more private. It is not a honeypot. If one GP system is cracked, then it's likely that only a small amount of data. If one patient system is cracked, it's a small amount of data. But you don't get it full population data. So there are advantages of keeping data separate. It also means that it's likely that the need to know principle is automatically accommodated because GPs see data that GPs need to see. If you go and see a psychiatrist, they'll have their own data and they may or may not allow patient access to it, but it's automatically firewalled off from the other data. So the need to know principle is automatically accommodated, whereas my health record totally trashes that. It puts it all together and there's no need to know basis. And in the early days of the development of this system, it was considered that they implement a need-to-know principle and they decided it was too hard. There's two areas. One is that the My Health Records system really needs to be reassessed. Certainly if they're going to make it 
opt out generally, certainly if they're going to make it compulsory, which is on the cards. In terms of privacy, it's a far greater risk to the average Australian than the census system. Bernard, thank you very much. No problem, appreciate it. Good luck, in. That was Dr Bernard Robertson Dunn, Chairman of the Australian Privacy Foundation's Health Committee. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. A special thank you to Andrew from Melbourne for his monthly donation. Would you like to hear your own voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, opinions, standing ovations, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com and please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. Check out patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the community radio network, including 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambaka Valley, and 3 MBR in the Mallee border districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos from this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.